Good morning, everybody. Hello. Does everyone have a handout or know where to find a handout? I'm asking because I don't know, but I'm assuming somebody. Look, John's pointing. That's good. Love that. Apparently, there are some Jonah handouts on the table. This is my subtle way of inviting all of you to our women's Bible study on Wednesdays where we're talking about Jonah. Seriously, feel free to take a Jonah handout home, but that's not what we're talking about this morning. Ooh. All right, I am, Court, can I ask you to come and pray so I can just, my, I had a run in with the printer downstairs moments ago and still recovering from that. Thank you. Let's pray while Abby takes a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to get enjoy each other, with each other, and to open up your word. And so I pray be with us um, during this next week together, be with Abby as you teach through her and help us to learn uh, something new about who you are and what you've done for us and what it means to be a follower of Christ. Let's call this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all, we are on week two of our new series for Coffee Pot, which is um, Whole Life Stewardship. And uh, for those of you who were here last week, you heard Court kind of give this introduction. We've been talking about this in our young adult Sunday school class. And then just with kind of everything that's going on in the life of the church, we felt like it would be a good thing to kind of expand a little bit and bring for all of us to discuss today. So just to recap last week, um, anyone find a steward, a caretaker? Yes. Someone that's been entrusted with someone else's resources to take care of those resources. Um, and here's, here was like a special thing according to the owner's what? Ooh, Emily got it right. Vision and values. Um, but this is helpful. It lets me know how chatty y'all are this morning. So um, a, a steward is both a ruler with authority, right? And then also a servant who is accountable to the owner. I'm going to say that one more time. A steward is someone who has authority to govern, but is also a servant accountable to the owner. So we talked last week about how everything we see is God's. Everything belongs to God. We were created to steward these gifts, being everything, uh, in order to glorify God and to love our neighbor. What's really um, cool about what Court was talking about last week is we have been running through something called the New City Catechism with Eleanor. Um, they have a playlist on Spotify. Parents, this is great stuff. They've got a playlist on Spotify that puts the questions and answers to music. And so every night before bed, Eleanor has stopped requesting other songs and is only requesting these songs. So question number two is, what is God? God is the creator of everyone and everything. How and why did God create us? He created us male and female. It's, it's really cool that Eleanor is getting these basic little uh, nuggets of truth. And then that was what we talked about in Sunday school last week. We were created by God and to enjoy him forever. So today, our uh, steward uh, item that we're stewarding or that we're talking about is time, um, which is so funny because court is preaching on Sabbath. So if you were in the 830 service, I hope you'll see how some of this weaves together. And I hope that none of this is a spoiler alert for those of you who are going to be in the 11 o'clock. I don't want to give anything too good away. So I'm going to open with um, this quote from a guy named Alistair Begg. He's a pastor at a Presbyterian church in Cleveland, and he's Scottish. So anything he says is just awesome because it's in a great accent. Um, and he says, uh, this is a quote from one of his sermons. We think, I'll get another chance. I'll do it next time. Once I get rid of this, once I finish that, once this, that, the next thing, the devil loves that stuff. His favorite word is tomorrow, but the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. I love that. The devil's favorite word is tomorrow. 
Uh, it's one of my favorite words too. Uh, Court, Court and I um, kind of have this joke in our marriage where he says, uh, why do tomorrow what you can do today? And I say, why do today what we can do tomorrow? And it leads to great uh, riveting marital discussion. That's what we'll call it. Um, but before we dive into this, I do kind of think that we might be in two camps. So I'm going to describe these two camps. I want you to think about which one you feel like you're in. And then we are going to do a show of hands. So be bold. So um, maybe one camp you feel like you actually do have a lot of time. Uh, you could be newly retired and you're not really sure. You could be uh, not, new, not recently retired and you're still just sort of figuring out what do I do with all of my time. Uh, you know, or maybe you're about to retire and you're worried. Uh, I'm going to pick on Gary and Melinda because I saw them. We had a party for Gary uh, a few weeks ago because Gary's retiring. And uh, Melinda was jokingly saying that they need prayers for their marriage because they're about to enter into a new season. So prayers for Gary and Melinda, guys. Um, so maybe maybe you're in this camp where you feel like you have too much time. I don't, I don't know. Um, or maybe, uh, regardless of your age or stage, you just feel totally, totally slammed. Like there is no margin, no time to do um, all the things you want to do. So think about your last week and how you spent your time. And think about next week and everything that you've got on your to-do list. I'm just curious, who feels like they do have too much time? Is there anyone? Okay. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's there. There's no right answer. I'm just genuinely curious because it'll help me guide the discussion. Okay, who feels like there is not enough hours in the day to do the things? Okay, so we lean maybe more as a group towards that, but there is also the reality that some of us don't know uh, what to do with the time that God has given us. Because uh, it's the same it, time is a resource just like money, right? So some of us have more money and some of us have less and some of us have more time and some of us have less. So we're gonna just sort of talk about, here are two issues that we find with um, time stewardship. Uh, we either spend too much time on the wrong things, right? That's one thing. Uh, we spend too much time on the wrong things. Uh, we could be, it could be good things that we're just sort of overemphasizing right it could be really good things i mean you can spend too much time on maybe i don't know bible study is that okay to say i don't know if that's all you're doing and you're not doing anything else uh yeah that would probably be a little too much or we're wasting time on things that are foolish um that is why i tell all of the youth to delete TikTok from their phones but they don't listen to me um so if you've got your handout on the front page, it's got three little bold face uh, titles. So we're going to kind of look at these a little bit. If you want to take notes, feel free. Otherwise, just use this as a guide. Uh, I really had fun with these um, titles, Time and Olden Times. So how did we get here? This is just a little history lesson. Um, young adults, y'all may have heard some of this before. But in Genesis 1.14, we do see a natural rhythm uh, in the creation story, a natural rhythm built into creation, right? So time is not necessarily a bad thing, right? We have uh, God creates the night and the day, uh, like pretty much right off the bat. So we, we already have like this idea of there's time, there's change that happens very regularly, not necessarily over a long, you know, we know that season to season, um, time, changes every every second uh it was measurable but it was all related to sort of creation uh you know they had sundials in olden times right sundials um but it wouldn't work if it was a cloudy day right so uh there was also this idea in the early church you've got monasteries that would um toll the bells at different hours right to signify different times of prayers it's really interesting but if you notice you pay really close attention to the gospels you can see that jesus actually does participate in some like morning prayer noon prayer evening prayer there are just different types of days that was something that uh christians or, or, or uh, jews anyone that really believed um they would kind of mark their day by times of prayer that was something that was sort of communal um they did not have a clock but in the 14th century, which is interesting because it's kind of right before the Reformation, right? There was a mechanical clock that was invented. 
So that's when we get to like really time hours and minutes and seconds. And then watches is something, I mean, does pretty much everyone in the room have a watch? Or if you don't have a watch, you've got your phone and that's how you tell time. There's clocks in like every room. Um, so uh, that has kind of become really commonplace, right? This idea that we can be, and uh, Court's watch really ticks. And so if he leaves at bed at night, I can hear it ticking and it drives me nuts. So like we can see time passing, we can hear it passing, like the tick, 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 right? And and I think that that kind of um, well, and then there's also this idea that in the in the industrial revolution, you move away from farming, right? From the the idea that uh, the day is really controlled. I mean, what a beautiful thing that in the winter you're sleeping way more because you don't have to be out, outside as much working the land. And now we're in. Uh, we're in sort of this more industrial post industrial revolution age right where what is what is tied to time profit. Uh, time is money right money is time, this is kind of what this is the world that we're living in. And so we think of time as something uh, that can be spent or wasted we think of it almost as a currency right and we are obsessed um, our culture is obsessed with time. Um, how are you using your time? Um, there aren't enough hours in the day. Um, this was something from Quartz Notes from our young adult class, but like sand through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Um, there's this anxiety that we're running out of time uh, because it, it reminds us of death, right? Like there's this, there's a, there's a stopwatch and it's going off and we don't like a timer. We don't know um, what it is that can be really anxious, right? That can be uh, anxiety inducing. And so the next thing I have, what do I have is, oh yeah, sorry. That's kind of, I kind of ran that all together. Time in our times is, is what we are living in right now. Time in our times. I was just having too much fun. Um, it's this idea that we have to be efficient with our time. We can't waste anything, right? Um, and, and we want to do the best we can to fill our days. We don't like that feeling we have when we uh, didn't get anything done. It feels like a waste. Or um, I was talking with my brother this weekend. He is a PhD student at Auburn. He's ridiculously smart. But he um, was talking about like, you know, his first job, like he would take it home with him and think that he had to like constantly be working on it. He couldn't stop even at five o'clock because that's like what what he felt like needed to be done. I think we all kind of feel that rush. It's hard for us to just sort of stop, which as court will reveal to us in the sermons, the word for Sabbath in Hebrew means stop. Um, that's what we want, right? We're desperate. We're craving for someone to just stop the time and just let us relax and be leisure, uh, be leisurely. So we have now sort of, again, more time in our times, this idea of time management. Um, Court used the phrase a cult of time management, where the goal is productivity, efficiency, optimization. This is all fun capitalism words, right? Squeeze every possible second that you can. And the lie of this cult of time management is that you can. That if you just work hard enough, you'll be able to maximize your time. If you have a good calendar system, you'll be able to do all the things that you want. And I'm a big list maker. I love calendars. They do help me get more done with my day. That is true. Um, but the lie is that if we are more efficient, if we work hard enough, if we do enough, then we will use our time the best we possibly can. Um, but we know that's a lie because uh, all of us feel like we don't have enough time. So it's sort of this uh, terrible, terrible cycle that we find ourselves in of, um, beating ourselves up about not getting enough done or uh, I mean it just it just it's it's just too much I mean even as I'm saying it like my I can feel my like shoulders tensing up thinking about all the things that I have to do and that I have to do them while also trying to convince um, a three-year-old and a one-year-old to please go to sleep so that I can do all the things that I want to do right like my my time uh, is dependent on the fact that I will get two hours to do stuff when they go to sleep at nap time and that's assuming that I don't uh, waste that time because I'm so exhausted, my brain won't let me do anything else. It's a terrible vicious cycle. 
So let's talk about God's time. Does that sound nice? Um, on the back of your handout, I have printed out a bunch of different Bible verses on time. Uh, and they're kind of out of order from how I'm going to talk about them. Um, but can I have someone read the Ephesians 5 verse? You'll have to stand up and do it really loud. Oh, John's got a mic. Thank you. Who wants to read it real quick? Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. That's on there, right? Yeah. Thank you, Todd. Look carefully, then, how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. They are. They're evil. Thank you, Todd. Um, uh, making the best use of time. Um, I can't remember which translation. I think it's one on your sheet, but it says redeeming the time. Uh, I love how it says time is evil, uh, and you're like, ah, what? Uh, redeeming the time. We have to, uh, the time is evil because of the fall, and so we need God to come and redeem time, just like he's going to have to redeem our broken bodies, um, our broken world. Time is broken. We need God to redeem time. But if you look down at that verse, you see that how to redeem time, how to really uh, capture time and make it submit to God's will is not about being productive versus being unproductive, right? It's about being wise versus being foolish. Uh, here's another verse that I think is really great. Psalm 90, verse 12. Can I have someone stand and read Psalm 90, verse 12? Thank you, Susan. I just love hearing y'all's voices, not mine all the time. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Mm. Teach us to number our days. Now, it, at first, it kind of sounds like this contradicts that idea that time is evil, right? But I think this is part of time's redemption plan. Teach us, Lord, to number our days so that what? So that we may get a heart of wisdom. So what this verse is saying is we don't have to be afraid of the fact uh, if we're in Christ. We don't be, we're not afraid of the fact that our time is running out. But we seek to remember that our time is running out so that we can live not productively, but wisely. God is not interested in us being productive. God is interested in us being wise. And uh, if you look, if you've got your Bibles, I didn't put this down, you can flip through, but Ephesians chapter 5 starts out in verse 1. So before we get to 15 and 16, it starts out with verse 1 saying, imitate God. We need to imitate God. So if Jesus is God, which he is, uh, Jesus is our example. Let's sort of look at some of the things that Jesus did when he was on earth. How did he spend his time? Um, if productivity or efficiency is our measure for the best way to use time, then Jesus was extremely unproductive and inefficient. Here's what I mean. He walked everywhere. He walked, uh, there's, a, there's a saying that Jesus, uh, that we serve a God who's a three mile per hour God. Jesus walked everywhere. He could have come at any time and any place. He could have waited to come till right now. He could have waited to come till there are flying cars if he wanted to get around the world as fast as he can, but he did it. He came in the first century where he knew he would have to walk everywhere. And he was, he was on the go for sure, but he was going at three miles per hour. Another thing that came with that is uh, that he was constantly interrupted, constantly. I mean, how many miracles can you think of? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to share, but just sort of think through your little um, catalog of miracles. How many times did somebody get healed while Jesus was doing something else and he was interrupted by someone needing something? Not only did he walk everywhere or let himself be interrupted, but he did this only having three years of ministry. The Bible tells us that Jesus began his ministry um, with what miracle? Do y'all know? 
the, the wedding at Cana, he turns the water into wine. He tells his mom, mom, it's not my time yet. And she said, you're God, you can do it. He said, yes, ma'am. So he turned water into wine. He um, began his ministry. And then not even three years later, he is dead, um, tortured to death on a cross. Just three years. And not only three years, but three years filled with interruptions, walking everywhere. The Bible also talks about, uh, if you want to go for efficiency, uh, he did not heal everybody that he came into contact with. There's this one story that's really actually encouraging to me as a minister um, where he actually walks by um, 50-ish sick people to get to one man by the pool of Siloam. If you know that story where the angel stirs up the water according to legend, that's not what really happens. So this man's trying to get to the water, but it's not just him there, right? There's tons of other people surrounding the water trying to get in. But Jesus, first, we don't know, he's God. He goes to that one man and heals him. And he has to walk by other people to do that. Jesus was never in a hurry. He was always letting himself be interrupted. And he was able to do this. Why? Because he was secure in his identity. He knew what his mission was. If you want to use the language that we've been talking about, stewardship, he um, understood the vision, the vision and the values of God because he is God. He understood the vision and the values. And so he knew exactly what to do um, because he knew what was most important. So he did not get stressed out. He was leaving all the time to pray. And that's what it said. He would leave the crowds to go and pray. That feels to me like a waste of time. Um, and so this is something that really should challenge us if we are thinking, how can we use our time well? Um, the other thing to think about, though, is that Jesus was not just, he's not just an example, like he is God. So we shouldn't um, beat ourselves up. We'll talk about this more in the sermon uh, today, but we are all just kind of like Pharisees looking for a checklist to get done, okay? So it would be tempting to turn everything I just talked about into a checklist, right? That's gonna be the temptation always to say, okay, allow myself to be interrupted, got it. Okay, gonna go more slowly through life, got it. Um, that's, at least that's my tendency. I love lists, like I said. So that's always the temptation. When we hear that Jesus is an example for us, that's our, gonna always be our temptation. Okay, we gotta be just like Jesus. We wanna grow in Christ likeness. So let's get a checklist out and let's do it. When we do that, we're going for efficiency, right? We're um, going for, uh, we're going for, yeah, productivity on how to be less productive. It's crazy. And that's okay. That's, that's because we're, we're that, that's our fallen nature that's come out. So the question then is, okay, so what do we do with our time? How do we um, spend it better? Well, I don't want to give you all another checklist, but the thing that I really do want to impress upon you um, is something that we talked about for four weeks, the beginning of the summer, which is to pray. I can't tell you how many times in my life that I've heard a sermon or I've read a passage or I've felt stirred in my heart to do something to change and I don't know where to start like I've got all this energy right. And I want to step into, uh, I want to take that energy and go with it while, you know, what is it? Strike while the iron's hot. I want to take that fire, that, that uh, flame that's been fanned, and I want to do something with it. I think that the Bible, that Jesus um, teaches us that, and it's, it's so counterintuitive, it is just crazy. Um, but the thing to do is to actually to stop and to pray. And so I can't tell you how many times I've had this feeling and I've been like, I don't even know what to do with it. I don't know where to go with it. Um, and then I'll, I genuinely just say, Lord, teach me or show me. And we don't have a whole heaven's opening voice coming down moment, not necessarily, but the Lord does start to put ideas in my heart or my head. And I kind of go for it. Or I don't feel anything at all. And I'm like, well, that was a waste of time. Um, 
but then I look back in a few years and I think, wow, the Lord really did show me how to how to uh, respond to that. So my first thing for y'all really is to pray, is to take inventory, to ask the Holy Spirit. Okay, Holy Spirit, I don't really know how to use my time. I don't know what to do. Um, I don't know how to become more uh, less efficient, more efficiently following you less efficiently. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to honor you with my time. And when we ask the Lord, um, I think the Lord really will reveal to you, maybe not like a big idea, like, okay, you know, here's how you can manage your time, but he will uh, put stirrings and longings in your heart and kind of move you in a direction. So that's the first thing. And if you're not praying um, by yourself, I encourage you to get a friend and pray with a group and, and um or come talk to one of your pastors and say, I, I really wanna know how to use my time better. I know what I'm doing is not good. Um, like I know it's not working, something's not working. How can, how, can, um, how can the Lord redeem my time? Remember, that's what we're going through uh, with redemption. John, I'm gonna grab this. Um, I think that this is where uh, Proverbs 16, nine comes in. And I'm just gonna read this for us. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And so that's something that prayer does for us, is it really reminds us who is the one that makes us step forward, even if we've got a plan and a map. It's the Lord. The Lord is the one who takes our best intentions, uh, our dreams, our hopes, our longings, and redeems them for his kingdom. Um, and so that's where Proverbs 16, 9 comes in. Another verse that I have on here um, that a little bit more about this is this James verse. I'm going to read it as well. If you've got your hand out. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. I keep saying prayer over and over again because I think it really is one of the few ways we can recalibrate ourselves to remind ourselves that it is not um, our time, our, the resource of time is not ours. The same way uh, money is not ours, the same way uh, the earth is not ours. Uh, the same way nothing that God has created is really ours. We are all stewards. And this James verse says that, right? It, it shows the human heart as to what? To make a profit. That's the human heart. That's, that's what we're always wanting to do, make a profit. How can we use our time best to make a profit? But we don't even know if we'll be here tomorrow. Um, and, and again, we don't have to be afraid of that reality. But that's where wisdom comes in, right? Going back to that Psalm, teach us to number our days, teach us that we are just a mist and that will change the way that we live because we'll be recalibrated to God's time, to God's understanding of what he has given us to do on this earth. Um, and here comes again in, in Colossians, this idea of uh, wisdom comes from a true understanding of time. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. So this is saying uh, the way that we make the best use of time is to walk in wisdom towards outsiders, is to show the world, okay, um, the best way that we can, you know, we talk a lot about evangelism, how do we share the gospel? Um, and there are always times where it is to clearly articulate with your words, who Jesus is, what he has done, um, and to invite others to accept that invitation. But another very practical way is to show other people, this is how we use our time. I remember when I was in high school, my youth leader said, what are you doing on Saturday night that prevents you from being able to wake up early to come to church on Sunday morning? We were in high school. I was like, I don't know. Um, and I think that's something that we can all think about. What, what are ways that we can um, 
walk in wisdom to outsiders. And, and so what that looked like uh, for my family, my parents would never let me spend the night out with friends on Saturday night because that would mean I wouldn't be in church with them on Sunday morning. Oh, and I hated them for it. It was so annoying. Um, but they did let me have people come spend the night with us. So that was the loophole. We got around it. But I think that's something that's really interesting. How, how can we speak with, uh, how can we tell our friends um, our lives are different? What, what does it look like to follow Jesus? How, what's one way that we say we follow Jesus is what, it, what does it look like to live our lives different, to walk in wisdom towards outsiders? This is just like one very practical way um, in order to make the best use of time. This is uh, evangelistic, right? How we uh, spend our time does model to the world what's important to us. Um, I want to end this time. We are going to have a lot of time for discussion, I think. Yeah, we've got a good bit of time for discussion. But I do want to end on this last verse, which is 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. It says, for he says, in, fav in a favorable time, I listened to you. This is a... Uh, Jesus talking, or this is uh, Paul talking. Um, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so that that flips for us uh, that uh, idea that I opened up with that uh, tomorrow is Satan's favorite word, right? Um, is that salvation is today. We live our lives very much as Christians in the here and now. We, um, we do not, um, we do not, I mean, it, it really all ties into stewardship as a whole, right? We don't store up for ourselves treasures on this earth. We store up treasures in heaven. We don't, um, we, we don't recklessly pretend like we're dying tomorrow, but we understand that it's, it's the Lord's prerogative uh, to take us whenever. And so uh, we want to use our time on this earth well to model that um, for others and to recalibrate ourselves to the lives of Christ or to the life of Christ. So here's, uh, I'm gonna end on this story. We'll have time for a uh, discussion, but um, I'm not sure if any of y'all have heard of, I think it was in 19, 90 something I was alive but um, in Memphis at uh, Shelby Farms there was a huge passion conference for college students uh, which y'all may have heard of passion now it meets in Atlanta but it was this outdoor conference held for college students and this was in the 90s and the keynote speaker was John Piper and y'all may have heard of this story but this is sort of how if you've heard the name John Piper this is kind of how he um, became very very famous he ended up writing a book called Don't Waste Your Life that really uh, was like a crazy bestseller. And it came from this conference where he was speaking and he tells the story. Um, and I'm actually, I'm gonna read his words. I found the manuscript, I'm gonna read his words and then we're gonna kind of talk about it a little bit. But this is what he says in front of all of these, remember his audience is college students. And I think this really, was crazy and kind of changed some lives. He says, three weeks ago, we got news at our church that Ruby and Laura were killed in Cameroon. Ruby was over 80, single all her life, a nurse, poured her life out for one thing, to make Jesus Christ known among the sick and the poor in the hardest and most unreached places. And Laura was a medical doctor and in her retirement partnered up with Ruby. She was also pushing 80, going from village to village in Cameroon. The brakes gave way, over a cliff they go, and they're dead instantly. And this is John Piper speaking. He said, I asked my people, is this a tragedy? Two women in their almost 80s, a whole life devoted to one idea, Jesus Christ magnified among the poor and the sick in the hardest places. After 20 years, uh, and 20 years after most of their American counterparts had begun to throw their lives away on tra uh, travailities in uh, Florida and New Mexico, they fly into eternity with death in a moment. Is this a tragedy, I ask? And the crowd knew the answer, calling out, no. It's not a tragedy. I will read you what a tragedy is. Um, he pulled out a page from Reader's Digest and he read it to him. This couple took early retirement from their jobs 
five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. They live in Florida where they cruise on their 30 foot fishing boat, play softball and collect shells. That's a tragedy, he told the crowd. And there are people in this country that are spending billions of dollars to get you, he's talking to the college students now, to get you to buy it. And I get 40 minutes to plead with you, don't buy it. With all my heart, I plead with you, don't buy that dream. As the last chapter before you stand before the creator of the universe to give an account with what you did, here it is, Lord, my shell collection, and I've got a good swing, and look at my boat. It's extremely uh, convicting and it's extremely emo it makes me emotional because I think if I'm honest most days that's the dream I'm chasing. I think that's what we're all chasing right we have to be honest about that. Because we want our lives to be well spent right we want to hear Jesus say to us when we see him well done my good and faithful servant that's what we crave right, but we forget. We forget all the time. We forget because the world wants us to forget. Satan really wants us to forget. He wants us to think, I'll do more, uh, I'll spend more time with Jesus tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read my Bible more. This is me. I'll read my Bible more and spend more time praying when my kids uh, can tie their own shoes, maybe. Um, I'll wake up earlier when I have more energy. Um, all these things we say we'll do one day, one day, one day. Maybe we will, but maybe I'll die tomorrow, y'all. And so I want to be able to um, spend my days like Jesus, which is slow and unproductive um, by human definitions, right? We have no idea how God will bless uh, the sacrifice we give of time. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about um, I'm not talking about doing more service. I'm not talking about doing more service projects. I'm not talking about all that, although maybe the Lord right now is calling you to use your time better. But the question we ask um, is, Lord, what do you want me to do with the time you've blessed me with? How do you want me to fill my days? And we have to recalibrate ourselves all the time. Otherwise, we keep getting sucked into this message that the world has for us, which is be more efficient, be more productive, make more money so you can uh, live more comfortably. It's not the message of the gospel. The message of scripture is brutal, but it's true. Life is extremely short. The master is coming back. That's the message of scripture. And we don't need to feel guilty. We don't need to feel oppressed because we have a good master who loves us, who's blessed us with these things um, to make us worship and glorify and enjoy him. So we're going to, I'm going to ask some questions, and I really want you all to talk about this at your table. Um, so I think I put them on the back. Yes, I did. If someone tracked my time for a month, what would they say my priorities are? Do I need to? Can I use my time for the sake of God's kingdom? And really, it's not just church work. This is just an invitation to take inventory. Because um, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want you to uh, retiring. Uh, being a tragedy if you're just sort of uh, catching seashells. I mean, I don't know, you may have had a really, really, really hard and traumatic life. And in your final chapter, the Lord wants to gift you with the blessing of enjoying his creation through seashells. Do you see what I mean? It's not about, um, it's not about, is this thing bad or is this thing good? It's, is this wise for me or is this foolish? And so uh, that leads us to our last question. Where is my time misplaced? where is it being used foolishly so i'm going to leave us uh for probably about 10 ish minutes to just sort of talk about this at your tables i invite you to be bold i know it's kind of hard especially if you don't know people um, at your table but uh try to be honest about this and if you're not sure just say a quick prayer in your head lord show me show me what you're trying to show me so let's do that let's break up for about 10 minutes and talk um, and then I'll, I'll kind of wander and float. If y'all have comments or thoughts, just flag me down. 
and then we'll come back together for one more kind of debrief session, if that makes sense. So let's talk about this together. Okay. All right, friends, I know you're all having riveting conversations. John said he didn't hear anyone talking about football, so that's a good sign. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to share either from what the, like any epiphanies you had as you verbally processed with your table uh, or anything that came up that was really uh, striking to y'all? Do you really feel like you're running out of time? Mm -hmm. Is that the real attitude or can you see past this existence yeah. to where time is not an issue? Or does that color yeah. how you live? This life. That's great. How'd you answer it? We had a variety of things. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. Anyone else have something they want to share from their riveting table discussion? Oh, Kathy. Our table of three sitting over here, you'll notice we all talked about retirement. Yeah. And how we use our time and what that time means. Yeah. So that's just um and that it is okay sometimes to get on that boat and take a cruise. Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong with that. God wants us to enjoy his creation. Mm -hmm. It's just what we do with the rest of the time. Exactly. Thank you, Kathy, for saying that. That's good. Linda. It's really interesting in our table. We have people that are different stages in their life. Mm -hmm. We have people who are at different stages in their life. And I shared a comment that a good friend of mine made me with regard to time management as I get older. And he said, I want to wear out mm. I want to wear out, not rest. That's... Linda, say it one more time for the people in the back. He said that he wanted to wear out, not rust. Mm. Gotcha. Wear out, not rust. I like that. The disciples spent a lot of time with Jesus, and they still were dysfunctional and didn't get it right. Mm -hmm. But he was God, so he yeah. could take his time. Yeah, exactly. And that's good news for us, right? The disciples didn't get it right, and they were living and eating and sleeping and breathing next to Jesus all the time. So it's, you know, it doesn't excuse it, but it gives us sort of that freedom to be like, all right, I'm not Jesus. I am not God. Garland. Kind of in regard to your last comments about how things look different for different people. And we, on the question number two, and how you use your life for the sake and time for the sake of God, that that will change. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look the same for every person. And it may look different depending on your stage of life. Yes. That sometimes you are showing Christ to your children. Yes. And sometimes you're showing Christ to an elderly parent, or sometimes you're showing Christ to strangers on the street. Or, and so because you are living Christ and showing Christ in that time, it's a season of time. Yep. And so that that will change or should change as you continue through your, your faith and growing in Christ. Thanks for saying that. And that's a that's a blessing. It's also hard, right? Because the next thing you know, you wake up and you're in a different phase. And you're like, well, got to reevaluate. That's that's one of the that's why I keep saying this word recalibrate. We just are constantly in need of recalibrating ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that might be my kid. All right. Well, how about this? Let's end. I want to um, I want to bring up a couple of things. I did not. Uh, I did not uh, read this verse, but 2 Peter 3, 8 on the back says, don't overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. That is really good news um, because it that, that should free us and give us hope to spend our time well, is that the Lord is outside of time. He is over time. He uses time as a tool. Um, but he is unchanged by time. I mean, it's it's just really, really comforting because he can do anything. Um, you know, our definitions of productivity just crumble at his feet because he can do something with uh, our weakness and make it look like the biggest strength. And that's true with our time. So let's rest in that fact. 
Um, my prayer for all of us today, I'm about to pray for us, but I, my prayer is that we would remember, uh, this was something Court's Table talked about when I was hovering, is that rest in the Christian walk is always the end goal, not a means to an end. That in the Christian life, uh, we do not rest so that we can work more. We work, you know, so that we can, we, we work for the Lord, work unto the Lord, knowing that one day we will rest um, in his arms fully and completely. Um, and that's how we, we think of this, uh, well done, my good and faithful servant, and that, that final exhale. So I'm going to pray for us, um, and then we can go continue to worship God together, uh, talk a little bit about Sabbath, more specific type of rest. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, you are the Lord of time. We love you, Lord. Uh, we want to use the gifts you've given us. We want to steward them well. We want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, would you, for those of us in this room who are feeling crushed by the guilt of not using our time well enough, would you free us from that weight? And Lord, for those of us who are sort of floating through life, feeling untethered and purposeless or confused about what you're calling us to, Lord, would you bring us uh, down? Would you give us a weightiness that we can feel your presence in our life, your direction, your hand guiding us, telling us which way to go? Lord, we trust you. We pray that you would help us recalibrate our hearts this morning. We long to be with you, Jesus, so we do pray that you would come this afternoon. Would you just come back? We don't have to deal with any of this anymore. Um, or come tonight, Lord. Come, come soon, Lord, Lord Jesus. We want to be with you forever. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, y'all.